My name is Rick Hillgartner. I work at the USCCB Secretary of Divine Worship. I serve as the Executive Director of that Secretariat. So I do a lot of collaboration with the Secretary for Clergy Consecrated Life and Vocations, which is putting this on. Uh, our office and the Bishop's Committee on Divine Worship were major collaborators in the preaching document, Preaching the Mystery of Faith, uh, as that was really an effort of the Secretariat and the Committee for Clergy. Uh, it, it, they drew in a number of other committees to consult with, including catechesis and evangelization, doctrine, ecumenical and interreligious affairs, um, uh, uh, cultural diversity, canonical affairs, and divine worship as, as a kind of a key stakeholder in, in, in so far as preaching as a liturgical event and a liturgical act. And I really believe that the homily, not only the Sunday homily, but the, the homily as it's set in any liturgical setting is in itself a liturgical act. It's not just a commentary on the word or a, a break or a parenthetical moment, but it's actually a liturgical act. What I'd like to do this morning, after we do some introductions and, and, and pause for brief prayer, is talk a little bit about how, just as a backgrounder, how the homily fits into the liturgical act and really what its function is in the liturgy so as to set the stage for how preaching at, at these particular liturgical and sacramental moments, in the sacrament of marriage, I'll say a few words about preaching at the rites of initiation, particularly infant baptism, and then, but really focus on the sacrament of marriage and the rites of Christian burial. But see how the homily has a particular function liturgically that we need to be attentive to as part of the rite, uh, especially as we are engaged in doing formation for preachers. So I've introduced myself and go around everybody. You could say who you are, where you're from, and what your ministry is in regard to preaching and preaching formation. I'm Dan Danielson. I'm from the Diocese of Oakland in California. I'm currently uh, the homiletic trainer or a teacher for the permanent diaconate candidates in our diocese. I'm also involved in clergy education for the last 40 years. And, and a deacon, so you're obviously involved in preaching as well. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a oh, priest. Oh, priest. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. So yeah, obviously sorry. engaged in preaching yeah, yeah. in particular in these settings. I'm Deacon Jim Caruso from the Diocese of Toledo. I'm the Vicar for Deacons and also the General Counsel for the Diocese. I assist in the formation process, so I really don't teach homiletics, but our teachers couldn't be here, so I'm here in their place. I'm Deacon David Shea from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. I teach homiletics in our seminary to both seminarians and to men in formation for the diaconate. <clears throat> Your colleague was at this session yesterday. Pardon me? One of your colleagues from Cincinnati was here at my I think session. Susan was. Susan was here yesterday, yeah. yes. Yeah. I'm Father Jim Teltorst. Uh, I left, I'm currently a pastor in St. Louis, but also work with the permanent deacon formation. So I've, I've been doing uh, work on Eucharist and presiding and preaching with them. Um, I left this place 30 years ago with a degree in liturgy, and they immediately told me to teach preaching. <laughs> so I did that for 10 years. But that was a long time ago. The reason I finished my degree, the reason I want to bring this up is just what you said. Um, I just finished my doctoral degree in preaching at Aquinas Institute on the topic of preaching as a preaching and presiding as a sacramental act. Great. Uh, just along the lines that you were trying to emphasize right. there. So. Well, I hope this can be a good conversation this morning. Yes, we will. <laughs> uh, my name is Dan O'Connell. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Boston, and I teach preaching to the permanent deacons. I'm Deacon Ray Purvis in the Diocese of Jefferson City, <clears throat> Missouri. I don't teach homiletics, far from it, but I'm the uh, coordinator of the deacon formation program, so I arrange for the priests primarily as the instructors of homiletics. And I do preach as a, as a deacon. Deacon Vernon Rose from the Diocese of Memphis. I'm a currently student, a doctoral student at Aquinas Institute, and uh, also liaison to the Bishop for the Charismatic Renewal in the Diocese of Memphis. Uh, I've got an interest in all of this. Wow. wow. In, in my ministry at the Bishop's Conference, working for the Committee on Divine Worship, I, I do a lot, obviously, with with liturgy in a, in a broad context, specifically spent a lot of time overseeing the work on the Roman Missal, uh, though I didn't write the translation. <laughs> <You're wonderful. laughs> uh, but in earlier ministry in uh, the Archdiocese of Baltimore, uh, which I belong to, uh, I taught homiletics at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore for, for several years. Uh, so I, I was involved in, in, in preaching formation, 
Uh, my degree is in sacramental theology, and I'm currently working on still on my doctorate uh, at Santa Anselmo in sacramental and liturgical theology. What I'd like to do is look briefly at what I see as the, the movement of the homily within the liturgy, and really the movement of the liturgical act, and how the homily fits into that. So I have two schemas that I would like to present, and then we'll talk specifically about weddings and funerals. It's not rocket science or anything earth shattering or new to equate the liturgical moment, the liturgical encounter with Christ, with the encounter of the disciples on the road to Emmaus with the risen Lord. There's four moments that I think describe that encounter that also apply to the liturgy, and in particular to a focus on preaching. And I'll just go through them here. The first is encounter. Specifically, as Jesus appears to the disciples, he begins to walk with them and converse with them, which really leads to the second piece, is dialogue. So they meet the risen Lord, they don't recognize him. We know the story well. It, it is our story in, in many ways. Uh, and as Jesus meets with them, he doesn't simply launch into teaching or telling them something, but he engages in a conversation and he begins to learn about where they're at at that particular moment. He learns about their struggle and their grief in light of his own death, keep in mind that they don't recognize him at that moment. And it's only after that conversation that he begins to teach them and then reveal himself to them in this gift of the breaking of the bread. And it doesn't end there, it's not just an encounter in and of itself, but then that whole experience with the risen Lord reorients them as they turn around and return to Jerusalem, which they had been fleeing. And suddenly now they go back with a purpose and a mission as witnesses as they go back and meet Simon and the other disciples where they announce that they have seen the risen Lord. That's the movement of every liturgical act. And I'd like to use this as the framework for our conversation about these particular liturgical acts this morning. We also need to all keep in mind, especially when we're talking about preaching in these particular settings at marriage and funerals, the rites of burial, that this in particular is a moment for the new evangelization. Bishop Coyne mentioned it last night, that we're often preaching at weddings and at funerals to an assembly that's quite diverse and quite mixed, though it's sometimes difficult to discern or ascertain who's there. Sometimes you can tell as a presider the minute you say, the Lord be with you, and you get either the silence of crickets chirping, or in these days you get that kind of hybrid of, and also with your spirit, or something <laughs> like that, this kind of combination of old and new. Um, so you can kind of gauge from some of those moments, but sometimes that's not really possible. Uh, where you have people who are there whom you might know, you might not know, but you can't judge simply because you've never seen them in your church before that they might not be active members of the faithful. They could be coming from another parish from out of town, or they could be people who haven't darkened the door of a church in years. They could be unchurched, they could be de-churched, uh, they could be fully practicing in another faith. Uh, we just don't know, but clearly we recognize that these are moments that are very much about the new evangelization. They're much, very much about evangelization in its broadest context, but in particular, where we might be meeting people who are coming to church who might otherwise be reluctant to do so, who might be reluctant to be part of us and part of our gathering and our worship. Sacrosanctum Concilium, here's just some, some basic backgrounders. Paragraph 10, reminding us that the liturgy is the source and the summit of the Christian life and then the place of the homily within the liturgy. The homily is a part of the liturgical action, not simply, as I said in the introduction, some kind of parentheses or bracket or pause for commentary, instruction, and catechesis, but it's very much part of that movement. Let me say a little bit more about that and, and try and relate that back to how the disciples on the road to Emmaus informs what we do, and I'll speak a little bit about sacrament, uh, about some sacramental theology in the midst of this. It is part of the liturgy and it is highly recommended for it is necessary for the nurturing of the Christian life. And this paragraph from the general instruction, paragraph 65, reminds us that we're not just preaching the scriptures, we're preaching the liturgical moment, the, the designation, the occasion, other texts from the parts of the liturgy. 
And so at weddings and funerals, in particular, we have not just the ordinary of the Mass, the order of Mass, or the propers, or the scripture readings, but we also have the elements of the rite itself. So we might, in funerals, look at the part of the rite of committal, or the final commendation, the rituals surrounding the reception of the body, to illumine or inspire preaching. At marriage, the rituals, the signs, and the symbols, in many ways, all these rituals, these symbolic gestures and actions, preach, if they're done right, if they're done well, they speak for themselves, and they preach even without words. The other piece of this, in, in that regard, is that all of these rituals are already textually laden, they're text heavy. I'm not gonna say much about baptism, but infant baptism, we're all sharing in that ministry, uh, is one of the most overly textual, textualized rituals we have. Everything, we talk about the explanatory rites, and the, the structure of the explanatory rites, the anointing with chrism, the presentation of the candle, and the clothing with the white garment, they're even explained in text. We don't just do the ritual, but there's all this text that's already laid on top of it. So the danger of drawing from all these texts is that the texts are already themselves explaining what's happening in ritual and in symbol. So we run the risk of over, overpopulating with words uh, some of these rituals and these rites. I, and I simply raise the question about sensitivity to how much text, how many words can these ritual moments bear? And we'll say more about that in terms of people's attention span when we, when we get into some of the specifics about marriage and, and, and funerals. Sacramentum Caritatis, which was cited several times yesterday, reminds us that generic and abstract homilies should be avoided. And those of us engaged in preaching know that that doesn't work well. One of the challenges, one of the particular challenges as we're doing formation for preachers today is part of the strain on ministry as numbers of priests decrease, the pressure to provide quality pastoral care in these particular circumstances becomes more of a challenge because Perhaps we have less of an opportunity to really know the people that we're gathering with to celebrate the funeral of their loved one. We have less of a chance of really knowing the deceased or knowing the family. We may have fewer opportunities to spend quality time with a couple that we're preparing for marriage, or as we discussed in yesterday's session, in many circumstances, the priest or deacon who's officiating isn't the priest or deacon who's providing uh, the preparation. You know, they're doing all these other elements in terms of pre-cana, engaged encounter, sponsor couples, marriage preparation classes, but there might be somebody else on the parish staff who's shepherding them through the preparation process and the priest or the pastor is kind of stepping in at the last minute, maybe not at the last minute, but even as it's planned, is only stepping in to act as the efficient and may not be the one who really knows the couple. So how do you preach effectively, avoiding the generic and abstract when you might not have the personal contact? That's another question I'd like to. What's paranetic mean? Paranetic theme of a homily. I've never heard that word before. I'm quoting it from Sacramentum Caritatis, and that wasn't, I'm sorry, a word that I was going <laughs> to. <laughs> 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 that was the biggest <laughs> idea with that. Uh, it's another word that I, it's a good question. I'm going to look that up. Anybody want to Google it quickly, and we'll, no, uh, we can come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. We all need to know, huh? Yeah, we all, we'll all need to know eventually. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let me move on structurally to the other movement of the homily that I think is very helpful in helping us see the importance of the liturgical element of preaching in these particular contexts. I am a big fan of Louis-Marie Chauvet, the French sacramental theologian. Uh, his great tome, uh, Symbol and Sacrament, is, is not exactly uh, like vacation beach reading. It's a 500-some <laughs> page uh, text. It's based on his doctoral work. But he describes this threefold movement in the work of the sacraments and really in the, in the work of, of the liturgy. And he begins by speaking of the whole notion of gift, that which God freely gives to us. We could describe it as grace in the most broad context, but there is this gift of God's presence, of God's revelation of himself to his people in a particular way. And that leads to the faithful's active reception of that gift in some particular way, in a liturgical context in particular. 
But it's not simply that God gives and we're somehow passively just being washed over like a stone in a river. But the act of reception is something that is an active process that engages the faithful, that engages the church in receiving something that God gives. We would talk about that in, in some ways as active conscious participation in the liturgy as we're actively participating in the work of God. And that reception leads then to what Chauvet calls the return gift as we give something back to God. And it's this cycle that keeps repeating. At marriage, we have a danger of talking about return gifts because that sounds like something altogether different you know, mm -hmm. uh, as they're looking at their bridal registries and what they want and don't want. Uh, but in, in any liturgical act, in, in, in really in the whole relationship with God, it's not a one-sided relationship. And even as we can't reciprocate what God gives to us freely and graciously through his love, we do try to respond to that in a similar manner, though we can only hope to have a shadow of that kind of self-gift of God. Let me put it another way. He then likens it to the gift in the most broad context he calls scripture, really just revelation, God's revealing of himself, giving of himself in some particular way. The sacramental moment is our active reception of that gift. And the return gift in the Christian life is both a cultic return gift as we give our worship to God, but also a, a, a gift, a return gift in living the Christian life, which Chauvet calls ethics. The go in peace glorifying the Lord by your life. We glorify God by our prayer and our worship, liturgically or cultically, and then we do so ethically in the way we live. I would suggest in this schema, in, 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 both, genre, in both ways of, of putting it, that the arrows here are the preaching. The preaching is the way that we can make that movement from what God gives to us as we then receive and give back to God. Preaching becomes the connecting point, the bridge. Think of it in the structure of the Mass, that the, as, as it's been put that the, the, the preaching, the homily, becomes the bridge between the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. As, as preaching leads the faithful to this particular act of praise and thanksgiving in sharing in the Eucharist, in offering this act of praise and thanksgiving and this sacrifice. And in fact, the bishop's document on preaching, preaching the mystery of faith, the Sunday homily, says that one might even say that the homilist connects the two parts of the Eucharistic liturgy as he look back, looks back at the scripture readings and looks forward to the sacrificial meal. Unfortunately, we published the preaching document without paragraph numbers, so I can't tell you mm -hmm. what paragraph that is. Uh, By the way, yes, I, I do have it. Paranetic. Yes. Um, of or relating to moral or ethical instruction, or of relating to paranesis. They're moral, and so it goes right back to the Chauvet piece about living the Christian life. Yeah. So within the liturgy, let me just put these all together as the, the Chauvet on top of the liturgy. So the homily becomes instruction and explanation. We're going to hear a lot more about that this morning from Father Driscoll as he talks about the catechetical and doctrinal side of preaching. And that becomes part of the scripture, the gift. The homily is meant to inspire praise and thanksgiving in the sacrament, the reception of the gift, and it orients us for mission, that ethical piece, really what the disciples' final movement on the road to Emmaus was as they changed direction and they returned to Jerusalem as witnesses. With me? No, can you hang? Just okay. a little bit. I want to capture this. Well, while we're anybody have comments or questions, and then we'll move into uh, 
something about audience briefly and then talk about weddings and funerals. Mm -hmm. Any comments or reactions so far? And I know this is all background. Those of you who are engaged in homiletic instruction, there's lots of categories for doing all of these things. I think it's helpful just to give mine as we then move into uh, some reflections on, on preaching in these two events. I've always understood that um, what seems to be missing in Eucharist is an understanding that the great elevation of the peripsome is where we begin to give ourselves in that great amen. Mm -hmm. That Christ being the total act of worship, we unite with that so that we are already giving ourselves back uh, in that action. Uh, if his lifting up is the, the worship of the Father, it's at that point in our amen to that, that we become participants in that. So, and that would then lead to the mission of it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it really begins, even as we prepare the gifts, gifts that pray, pray that, pray that and our translation is not the best at that moment. Right. That my sacrifice and yours really should right. be this sacrifice, mine and yours. And the challenges of the English, the, the sense of a single sacrifice, which is the priests and the faithfuls. And unfortunately, the way we word it, it sounds like we could be referring to two sacrifices. <laughs> but in the Latin, it's very clearly a single sacrifice that may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. So yes, it's this one sacrifice that's offered, and it's that whole act that gives it over, you know, that, that final concluding doxology, that, that final act of praise in the, in the parapsum is where it all gets caught up. And yeah, you're right, everything from there becomes oriented to mission mm -hmm. as we share in communion and then are sent forth. Right? All right, let's say a well, word about audience. Uh, and <clears throat> a, a little bit about, and, Here's where I want to go from here. So talk a little bit about audience in a broad context in preaching, and then apply it in particular to funerals and then weddings. So we'll talk about preaching at funerals, preaching at marriage, and then come back and talk about some of the challenges of preaching in both of those contexts and some of the, some of the things that we have to overcome or be aware of, especially as we're training others or working with others who are preparing to preach, uh, how we might uh, work with them and at least raise issues to be uh, sensitive to as we preach in these, in these contexts. I mentioned that one of the challenges with weddings and funerals in particular is knowing the assembly. We're saying two different things when we, pre when we talk about the Sunday assembly or the daily mass crowd if we're preaching on a day-to-day -day basis. So clearly assemblies that we know well, uh, if, you're, if you're a pastor, if you're engaged in stable ministry in a parish or a cluster of parishes, but when we talk about preaching in these contexts, we're always talking about a larger, broader context that we might not know. Extended family, friends, people who travel some distance, who come from outside the local community. I, I would dare say that most of us, if not all of us, are ministering in communities and the way our dioceses look in the United States. It would be rare to see the kind of places where people live in such isolation that you wouldn't have visitors even on the occasion of weddings and funerals. Sometimes, it, sometimes you might have those, those funerals or those marriages where it very, is, very much is a parish event. It was some pillar member of the community, but even there, there'd be some extended family or friends from, with, from outside the community. And I'll, I'll give a couple of examples as, as we go along. But sometimes knowing the assembly in this particular context provides some particular pastoral challenges. In the case of funerals, you've got three, four days notice, sometimes two. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of time. With marriage, you might have six months or a year to know the couple, and you might know something about their extended family, but you're not really beginning to meet the assembly until the rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner, when you might learn some stories or learn or be able to gain a little bit of information or insight into who this extended family is, who this gathering of people is, and maybe pick up on some particular sensitivities. Uh, culture is clearly an issue in, in, in this particular context. There's a whole other workshop on culture. Did any of you go to the culture workshop yesterday? Workshop on cultural diversity? 
that Father Depp did. I would suggest that in many ways we talk about preaching that's overheard. And it's one model for preaching in particular at marriages. We do it with confirmation, bishops do it at confirmation all the time, where they preach to the confirmands and everybody else is kind of overhearing the conversation that's taking place. It's one approach to preaching at marriage where the preacher might speak directly to the couple and everyone else is overhearing it. It's one model that could be effective. We used to do it with children's liturgy in that mm -hmm. stage yes. where you bring the children into the sanctuary and talk to the children at, at a level and using images and metaphors and stories that speak to them. Everyone else benefits it because they're, benefits from that because they're overhearing. So it's one way, to, it's one approach in terms of focusing your words and reflections to a particular segment of the assembly. And in these cases, maybe you're speaking to the grieving widow and the, the children left behind at a funeral. You're speaking directly to the immediate family, the mourners. Or uh, the funeral of a, of a young person, you might be speaking to their peers and everyone else is kind of overhearing it as you're targeting all your words to to one particular part. And, and I was at one priest funeral where the homily was addressed to the deceased. <laughs> wow. And very effectively. Wow. Now I would bracket, and it got said yesterday, I think Bishop Coyne mentioned it, that we kind of break a lot of rules at priests' funerals and maybe deacon funerals too. Your dioceses have strict policies about eulogies and limiting eulogies, and we always talk about it. That one of the next slides will be what the Order of Christian Funerals says about homily versus eulogy. <laughs> and you go to a priest funeral, <laughs> and it's as though we just put all of that aside and say, well, there is that, but we want to do this. <laughs> This has been discussed a lot, this, this question of what was in um, the earlier preaching document fulfilled in your hearing about, pre about preaching that's evangelical or that, that first announcement of the gospel using the RCIA as the model, evangelization, catechumenate or catechesis, and mystagogy or what Bishop Coyne called liturgical preaching. We had some interesting discussion in yesterday's <coughs> session uh, about what happens if you're trying to do something that's more evangelization, does the liturgy suffer if the mystagogical piece isn't there? And I would suggest that that's something to be sensitive to. I think that's what Bishop Coyne was trying to say. Today from Father Driscoll, we're probably gonna hear a little bit of the opposite about yeah. the catechetical piece. I would suggest as a liturgist that we can never be too far removed from the mystagogical or liturgical piece because of the connections, go back to the Chauvet schema, go back to the road to Emmaus, that the preaching, the dialogue, is what moves us to the sacramental encounter. And if all we do is stay at that moment of evangelization or catechetical instruction without any sensitivity to the liturgical function of the homily, well then we fail to make that movement to the liturgical act itself. That movement to the altar, to the offering of sacrifice, the movement to the celebration of the sacraments of initiation, or that movement to the sacrament of vocation and marriage, or with a grieving family, that movement through the rites of final commendation and committal. Not sacramental per se, but, uh, but clearly still a liturgical and ritual moment that, that, that is of substance. I simply raise the question at this point. I think we need to be sensitive to all of it, and, and as Bishop Coyne was saying yesterday, that there really is some kind of balance, but we need to be sensitive to that balance in this particular context, I believe. So let's talk now about funerals and marriages. The Order of Christian Funerals says this, paragraph 27 in the Prenotande. A brief homily based on the readings is always given after the gospel reading at the funeral liturgy and may also be given after the readings at the vigil service, but there is never to be a eulogy. It goes on, and, and we know that there are rules we, when, you, when you speak about the appropriate place for remembering and memorial, the, the nostalgia piece, there is room for that. And we'll see that as paragraph 27 goes on. I think there is an appropriate place. Normally, I always encourage people at the vigil service to do that or sometime during the visitation. When people are naturally sharing stories, it might be a time to do that in a more formalized way. 
sometimes as deacons or priests, we might get trapped in the middle of that, and you know, then it becomes the open mic time, and, and how do you extricate yourself from that? <laughs> you know, if you try to do it during the wake service, um, I always try, try to encourage if there's a need for that or a desire to do that, to, to do the wake and then have that follow or flow from that after or before uh, in, in some way. If it has to happen, and in my diocese there's a policy that there can be one eulogy, but there should only be one, and it needs to be brief, I do it at the beginning of the liturgy. Either, if I can, have the family do it before we begin at all. If need be, I do it after the reception of the body, sprinkling with holy water, placing of the pulp, placing Christian symbols before the collect. So as part of the receiving and welcoming the body, let's recall the life of the deceased. Then having done that, we then enter into the, the real substance of the liturgical act. But here's what paragraph 27 goes on to say about the homily. Attentive to the grief of those present, the homilist should do several things. Dwell on God's compassionate love and on the paschal mystery of the Lord as proclaimed in the scriptures. Secondly, Help the members of the assembly to understand that the mystery of God's love and the mystery of Jesus' victorious death and resurrection were present in the life of the deceased and that these mysteries are active in their own lives as well. Here's where we get that, that moment to, to personalize and speak of the life of the deceased, not simply to eulogize, but to speak of that as a way of pointing not to the deceased him or herself, but point to Christ, point to the Paschal mystery. Now, depending upon the circumstances of the life of the deceased, that, that may be easier or more difficult. And depending upon how well one knows the deceased, and in many cases, if a pastor is a pastor of a very large parish, is new to the community, is ministering to multiple communities, maybe doesn't know the deceased at all. In this case, this is one of the other reasons I find it helpful to have, the, to have a eulogy at the very beginning, that I get to hear it, and then it somebody observed yesterday, it takes some of the pressure off the homilist to have to talk about the life of the deceased, mm -hmm. especially in a case where he might not know them. Then the homilist can more effectively dwell on what the rite says, preach the Paschal mystery, preach Christ. Lastly, paragraph 27 says, through the homily, members of the family and community should receive consolation and strength to face the death of one of their members with a hope nourished by the saving word of God. This is the whole of paragraph 27. I would suggest, especially as we teach preaching, that paragraph 27 becomes something of a checklist for the homilist at a funeral. That in some way, the homilist needs to do these three things in order to preach effectively so that the rest of the liturgy can do what it is trying to do in giving this gift of hope and the promise of the Paschal mystery in the face of death, in the face of grief and sadness at a time of loss, so that the, fa the faithful can, with some sense of hope, face death. So let me summarize that. The aim of preaching at funerals, I would suggest, is consolation, hope, and encouragement. At some level, evangelization. Again, we don't really know it might be difficult to assess the state of the faith, the place of the faith of the assembly gathered in that context, providing a particular challenge. But we're always preaching the gospel. I had a classmate in seminary who I think was struggling with how he was going to preach at weddings and funerals, weddings in particular. I don't know if he was nervous about that. Faced some kind of, internally, I believe, some kind of apprehension about were people going to challenge him that what, what would he have to say about marriage because he wasn't a marriage person? And when we preach on Sundays, we're preaching in some ways from our own experience. And while we say that we don't want to be overly biographical when we preach, autobiographical, uh, we are preaching from the heart. As we said yesterday, the heart speaks to the heart. And so we preach from our own faith. And in some ways, having wrestled with and dealt with the questions that we're preaching about. At a marriage, for priests anyway, by and large, unless we're talking now about the Anglican Ordinariate or priests who've come under the pastoral provision or priests who are widowers, all those kind of exceptional circumstances. For most priests, we're preaching marriage 
not having been married. For all of us, we're preaching funerals still in the same place as all the living. We, we know on faith what we believe about the Paschal mystery and the promise of resurrection. But it's not as though any of us has been there and can come back and say, let me tell you. Let me tell you what God's will is. Let me tell you all these things. We can't speak that way. What we can do is preach our own faith in the resurrection. What we can do is, with firm conviction, say what we believe about the promise of Jesus. And that's a perspective that could be very helpful. And that's a moment of evangelization, preaching the gospel, preaching the cross and resurrection. Lastly, and this is part of the movement, part of that cycle, we're always in the Eucharist offering praise and thanksgiving. And so at some level, we're giving thanks for the, the life of the deceased. We're giving thanks for the Paschal mystery. And it, it does still need to lead people to that moment of offering praise in the Eucharist. Here's a, a moment that it's helpful for preachers to be aware of, I believe, what the liturgical books say about what is permitted, what is, what is suggested. And one of the moments that's adaptable in the liturgy is a moment to offer a brief exhortation to the faithful before the liturgy of the Eucharist, before the Eucharistic prayer. And I often, I, I rarely do it, but funerals are the one time when I often do it, is before the preface dialogue, say a word about this act of praise and thanksgiving, that even in the face of death, even in a moment of sadness, we are still offering this great prayer of thanksgiving. And maybe that great prayer of thanksgiving is marked with sadness. It's not jubilant or joyful, but it's still a hopeful and faithful offering of praise and thanks to God for the gift of this person's life, for the gift of the promise of life in Jesus. The homily should do that, but there's also this bracketed moment as we lead into the liturgy of the Eucharist, as we lead into the Eucharistic prayer itself, to be able to say something about praise and thanksgiving, even in a moment of, of sadness, uh, in a moment of grief, in a moment of loss. Knowing the particular assembly is helpful in that regard. And, and you may or may not be able to judge that. Preachers may or may not be able to really have the pulse of the assembly in that particular moment. But to the extent that a preacher does have that sense, using these kind of moments can, can I think, be helpful. So a word about some themes, and then we'll pause for some conversation about funerals and then move on to weddings. This is not an exhaustive list at all, and we've already really hit on, on some of them, but by way of summary, we certainly talk about the Paschal mystery. Maybe we don't bounce that term around too frequently in preaching because it's one of those church words that some people get and other people who aren't really with us, who aren't members of the faithful in, in, in that strict sense, really get. But we need to be preaching the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us. We need to be preaching Christian hope, talking about last things. Again, we don't probably make use of the word eschatology or eschatological in the middle of a funeral hub. But we certainly are preaching about it. talking about forgiveness, talking about redemption. And this, I think, is a moment with sensitivity, perhaps, to talk about the life of the deceased. Because while there might be this danger, this temptation to want to canonize the deceased as a means of consolation, to always say, oh, what a good person, we know they're in heaven, and go through that kind of canonization process, that could be a dangerous thing. The other extreme is then and, and some of the orations, some of the proper prayers in the rite, certainly in the Roman Missal, taught you do not count this person's deeds against him or her, but grant forgiveness. You've got these extremes that are bracketed about, well, do you canonize the deceased, or do you presume that all we can do is pray for forgiveness and implore God's mercy because they were such an SOB? <laughs> you know, somewhere in the middle, normally, is probably where we need to land in a way that's sensitive to the mourners. Don't just offer this Pollyanna consolation and say, oh, everything's fine because they're with God, because we don't know. We can't presume to know what God's will is. We can't presume to explain why somebody died and what this moment means. 
but we can talk about forgiveness. And it can be an exhortation then for the faithful who are there gathered, perhaps to find some encouragement to live their faith in a particular way. In that way, it becomes a moment of evangelization too. Obviously, we've already talked about Thanksgiving. I'd suggest that talking about communal life, the communion of the church, here's another moment of evangelization. I think in the face of death, people understand the importance of community in a way that perhaps some people might not otherwise recognize. You see all these outpourings of grief you know, when people send flowers or send cards. They send the casserole over to the family's house and help provide the luncheon and all these things that people provide for. And, and suddenly mourners might see how community really works. And maybe it's a time to talk about the presence of the church in a way that's uh, simply pointing to here is where grace is manifest. Here is the consolation of the presence of Christ. Christian living and Christian witness. Part of it is the preacher witnessing. Part of it is how then the faithful who are gathered, the mourners gathered, are experiencing witness through the life of the deceased, through the life of other people offering them consolation, and how they then might be motivated to persevere, to have hope in the midst of, of loss, in the midst of death. Other things that we could add to this list? I've been observing lately at funerals, it's, it's become almost a hobby, but um, the, the struggle we have unknowingly with what happens next. Uh, so you get everything from the canonization you get a lot of they're in the bed, they're in a better place, and then they begin to describe that place with all their friends and their relatives, and God's never mentioned it. I said that to somebody the other day. I noticed that um, everybody gets to go to heaven and be with their friends, and they're going to be fishing like they used to fish and playing cards like they used to play cards, and God's never mentioned in that scenario. Um, and the other one is. Uh, all this assurance that uh, they're now with God immediately. And by the way, here's here's a check to say 10 masses for them. <laughs> <laughs> How's this all fit together? Yeah, how does that all fit together? You, you want to be, they want to be remembered at mass, but they're already sitting with God, or with their, at least with their relatives, <laughs> not with God, so. <laughs> and, and then you go to the graveside. I, I had a funeral on Saturday, and in my work at the Bishop's Conference, I, I, I do weekend help in parishes most weekends. I, I do a fair number of weddings because I was a campus minister before I worked for the Bishop's Conference, so I have all former students coming and asking me to do weddings. I rarely do funerals. Um, I had a funeral on Saturday for a family friend, and it was a funeral that I would have attended anyway, but I, I uh, was asked to be the uh, presider and homilist. And it struck me, because I can still count on one hand the number of funerals I've celebrated with the New Roman Missal some of the orations and the prayers about what they presume or don't presume about the state of the deceased. And then it struck me, because I knew I was coming to do this workshop, at the graveside, that when we're blessing the grave and doing the prayer of committal, that it's grant that our brother may sleep here in peace until you awaken him in, in glory, and then he will see you face to face. Which is very different than this tendency to say, they're with God, they're in a better place, well, part of the Paschal mystery and part of our understanding about eschatology is this getting caught up that there's bodily resurrection and there's the state of the soul with God and that journey to heaven. Uh, the reality is it's all this both and and th th this rather ambiguous place. And I think we need to be training preachers to be more attentive to the language we use without being overly presumptuous in one direction or another. There's no easy answer to that. I think sometimes we run the risk of going to those cliche kind of expressions. Like sleep here in peace is a, is, a, is a really cliche expression, which applies simply to a body in the ground. Right. Unfortunately, that cliche expression is embedded in liturgical texts. I understand. You know? but, I mean, that's um, what it is, though. but all of that better place, God's will, you know, they're in heaven and you know, oh, he's reunited with his wife now, or uh, whoever preceded them in death. Uh, and to some extent, we all fall into the trap, sure. because the families are often doing that. Yesterday, it was raised that, 
what, what happens in the evangelical churches at funerals, it's mostly a celebration of a person's life. And there, there isn't this movement to talking about God. There isn't this movement to talking about the, the, the Paschal mystery in, in some cases, where it just becomes a memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're doing is celebrating the Paschal mystery. And as a, as a consolation and a, and a liturgical act for the living, we aren't just memorializing and saying, oh, let's look back with nostalgia at the person's life and say, oh, what a, what a life that was. But let's look at life in Christ. And that's why I have the Paschal Mystery at the top of the list. I have kind of the opposite <clears throat> side, I, I suppose. Also, very seldom as a deacon do I preach in a homily, unless it's a family or mm. associate, something like that. And then it's then it kind of becomes that challenge of preaching to family who are no longer practicing the faith. I won't say that they're not believers. <laughs> but, you know, kind of the, on one hand, wanting to chastise them that, hey, if you expect to get to heaven someday, <laughs> versus the, you know, not being judgmental. I, I find that a challenge for myself. Yeah. Deacons, though, are, are going to preach a lot of vigil services. That, that's true. Yeah. Do, and do, yeah. they, they, so they're, they're, or they don't have a liturgical act immediately following. They, they are preaching from the gospel, yeah. from the scriptures. Right, sure. And it's, over, it's part of the overall uh, celebrations of Christian funerals. Uh, but and, a, deacon, a lot of deacons do that yes. and have to be ready for that. And, and I would suggest that, and I, I really hadn't planned on getting into that in a particular way, but I would suggest that as we're training and doing formation for preaching in that context in particular, understanding the movement of that station in the rites of burial, it's a different moment. It, it's still leading to the funeral mass and ultimately committal, but it's a different station. It's where the memorializing, the, the reminiscing, the nostalgia piece is really taking place in an informal context. And the preaching at the vigil service, I think, has a different function. In, in some ways. It's still preaching Paschal Mystery and all these things, but understanding the context that it's not the immediate movement to the Eucharist, right. uh, but it's it's this kind of pause for prayer in this ritual moment in the presence of the body with the mourners while they're mourning in, in a more active way because it's the telling the stories and people gathering and you know coming into the funeral home, seeing the widow, seeing the children, seeing the parents or whoever the relatives are and saying, you know, it's while the, in the midst of those conversations, I'm so sorry, what happened? Is there anything I can do? It's in the midst of that that we're going to pause for prayer and be consoled by, by the, the promise and the, the, the word of the Lord in the presence of Christ. And, and there again, not the language of the ritual so much, but even the, the, uh, uh, the text preceding it. Why, why we gather as community of the faithful. That's usually my homily right there for the vigil sure. service, right from those words. Yeah. And in many cases, you've got an assembly there that isn't even in church. So you, you might have people who say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a member of the church. I'm not going to go to the funeral. I'll go to the funeral home. Mm -hmm. right. And so you've got a much more broad, broad gathering. You might have colleagues, coworkers, you know, people who know the family but don't feel comfortable going to the church for one reason or another who somehow find themselves trapped at the vigil service. <laughs> they thought they were going to make their drop by and their, you know, offer their grief, and they get caught at the vigil service, unintended. And very often the deacon has very little knowledge of this person and little and less notice. Really? You know, the priest can't make the vigil service, so he calls the deacon. An hour or two before. One day or yes. two days or two <laughs> hours to get yourself down there. Though I would suggest that what we understand about the nature of the diaconate. Now, practically speaking, I recognize all kinds of structures and ministry assignments and things like that, and deacons who are in part-time ministry in the parish because they still have a full-time job. But when you look at the nature of the diaconate and some, how some of our parishes are being restructured, the deacon might be the person who has more personal contact with the members of the parish than the pastor might. And maybe we'll see more deacons preaching at funerals because the deacons are the ones who are more closely linked where the pastor might be pastor in four or five places and might be coming in and doesn't know the family, the deacon becomes the bridge. And I would say that's part of the nature of the diaconate, that the deacon is the one who's 
in with the people and caring for their needs in charity and pastoral care while the pastor priest is concerned with the preaching and, and the sacramental rites, but the deacon ends up because he knows the faithful more in some settings. Maybe this is an idyllic kind of structure. I'm curious in opinion. The presider who makes an announcement before communion, knowing that many people in the church uh, haven't practiced their Catholicism in a, in a long while, and will make the speech about those who are properly disposed may come forward, everyone else is invited to sit down and wait versus the priest that doesn't make that announcement, but still understands full well that there are people to use an old phrase, are not properly disposed mm -hmm. to receive the sacrament, uh, needing to take the gum out of their mouth before they come mm -hmm. down the aisle. Uh, I'm curious about opinions, the speech, not the speech. How does, I, think how? That, I think there's a way of doing it. I, I argue this a lot. I think it's just honest not to say something, because you leave people very, mixed up and confused yeah. and not knowing, I'm not a Catholic, should I come forward? Everybody that yeah. he was going, should I go? I think it's dishonest not to say something. Now how you say it is another matter. Just What I usually say is, uh, you know, those of you who are Catholic and prepared to receive communion may come forward now and I explain how to do that. Uh, if you are not Catholic but wish to receive a special blessing on this day, just come up with your arms across your chest or you may be seated. And nobody has taken offense at that, but at least it's honest. I'm not leaving people confused and messed up. I, I would agree, and I've had that experience where people have said, "Thank you." I just I was confused. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And we'll, let's come back. I, I want to jump in. Periodically, when I make the announcement, I say, and I ask those who are not coming to communion to pray that someday our churches may be united as one. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's what the official policy of the bishops' conference actually says yeah. for those not coming to communion to, to join them. I usually say, I, I, count, I couch it in, here's the traffic pack. I say, those who share a faith and wish to participate in sacramental communion this morning, please come forward by the center aisle and return by way to the side aisle. You may kneel and be seated as you return from communion. So it, it raises the question, and I, I say it in the most broad context, those who share our faith. So it raises the question, say, oh, should I or shouldn't I? It, it doesn't say something quite so overt as mm -hmm. proper disposition, only members of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Because of the sensitivity of grieving, mourning, um, I, I hate to use the word hospitality, but well, let, Pope Francis is using it, so yeah, yeah let's use yeah, it. Yeah. Hospitality and not just, not saying, okay, here's the checklist, but still raising the question, people generally know, I think, right. you know, they, they know by reputation what we're about. Um, I wouldn't presume, you know, if a family's doing a worship, a printed worship aid, I don't make them put the guidelines for communion in. No, no, no. They're printed in our hymnals, they're printed in our missalettes. It, it, there are plenty of places that, it, that, that it's printed. Um, so I, I err on the side of brevity, but, and again, it, I use it. The but you do, I have, you do use it, you do? I do say something. You do. If I feel there's a need to. The, the funeral I had on Saturday was uber Catholic. It was one of these rare ones. The guy was an active member of the church. He was an active usher. He was involved in political life. He was a volunteer for the state Catholic conference. His extended family and friends. I could tell the minute I said, "The Lord be with you." It, this was a this was a Sunday assembly of active members of the church. Uh, there were about four other priests kind of celebrating. One of the auxiliary bishops was there. There was no need to say a word. Everybody came to communion, and everybody knew how to come to communion. I never even had to say center aisle, side aisles. It was obvious. Um, people knew how to behave. I knew it because I knew the family. My mother was one of the lectors at the funeral mass, because uh, our family was good friends with the deceased's family. Uh, but I could tell throughout the liturgy, people knew how to behave. People sang, they participated, they knew responses, they knew postures without any prompting. Um, I didn't have to say, and I think that's a sensitivity about yeah. knowing the situation. You, you may yeah. have to. We get these cases where the only member of the church was the deceased. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, in those cases, it helps to have the funeral choir who can at least help lead the responses, so you don't feel like you're talking to an empty church. I, I, I've heard some presiders come out with some pretty horrific uh, disclaimers just before communion. Wow. And then, if you question question them about it. There seems to be a very, very sincere need in them to somehow protect the Eucharist that you can't, uh, you can't fight with either. Yeah. Some, somebody said in yesterday's workshop at, at funerals, 
we should be following the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no first, harm. First, do first, do no harm. harm. Yeah. Uh, because we've got people who are hurt already, who are already hurt, sure. who are already mm -hmm. grieving, who may be in church because they're grieving, but otherwise haven't been in church in a long time, and, and maybe there are legitimate reasons why they haven't been in church in a long time. So maybe this is a moment to heal. Yeah. And I'm not saying we throw the rules out the window, but at the same time, in preaching, we might be well intended in evangelization and you know talking about coming back to church and preaching to people we know haven't been to church, but do it in a way that at least doesn't do any harm. Hmm. So. All right. Well, let's let's move on to talk about weddings, <laughs> with its own set of challenges and another set of do no harm. Different ones. Different ones. Uh, the order of Christian marriage. This is the 1970 edition, because we're in the process of preparing a new translation on the uh, 1991 Editio Typica Altera of the Ordo Celebrandi Matrimonium. After reading the gospel, the priest in the homily uses the sacred text to expound the mystery of Christian marriage, the dignity of conjugal love, the grace of the sacrament, and the responsibilities of married people, keeping in mind, however, the various circumstances of individuals. Now that also sounds like a lot of what would be the uh, syllabus for marriage preparation programs. Mm -hmm. the, the danger of preaching marriage is to try and do a whole catechesis to summarize the marriage preparation process in a five to seven minute hum. Uh, at the funeral, in the funeral prayer tanda, it mentions brief homily. The marriage rite doesn't say brief homily. <laughs> yeah. I would say it's presumed. Again, the, let the right speak for itself in some ways. The couple is the sacrament. And in some ways, what we do is we point to the sacrament. In the new edition of the rite of marriage, in the third form of the rite, the marriage between a Catholic and a catechumen or a non-Christian, the draft translation says about the homily, after this, there should be a homily, it means after the readings, there should be a homily on the sacred text which should be adapted to the responsibilities and situation of the couple and other circumstances. Keeping in mind here we have a non-sacramental marriage because it's between a Catholic and a non-Christian. Uh, and the circumstances could be widely varied depending upon the faith of the non-Catholic or the non-Christian. If it's an unchurched person versus if it's an actively practicing member of, of, of Judaism or a Muslim, uh, all kinds of, of, of circumstances adapting to the needs of, of the people. Uh, so let me just point out some things, the, the goals of preaching at marriage. The aim of preaching would be encouragement to the couple and to the assembly about Christian living. Again, thanksgiving, because it's a liturgical act, it's always oriented to praise and thanksgiving and worship of God. We're not just gathered for this couple to exchange their vows and be married, but it's the worship of God, praise of God, thanksgiving of God for this mystery being celebrated and, and seeking God's grace for this couple. So a challenge to live a vocation, I think that's a key moment in terms of how we as priests and deacons, especially those of us who aren't ourselves married, this is the key moment of connection about living a Christian life in a particular way. And obviously, as we've said, a moment of evangelization, especially when we, we talk about the, the statistics about young people and their place in the church and their participation in the life of the church, we know that marriages in a particular way are moments of evangelization because we've often we've got couple, the, the, the couple themselves might not be all that actively practicing, and their reasons for having a wedding in the church are widely varied. You know, tradition, custom, my parents are insisting on this. It's the pretty backdrop. Um, you know, it's the you know, length of the aisle. The length of the aisle. Yeah. <laughs> my, my second assignment, my first assignment in my par in my diocese in Baltimore as a priest was at a, a hideously ugly 1960s church, beloved parish, but not exactly a wedding factory. It had a huge parish, lots of young people, but most of them avoided getting married there because it was dark. The seal. It was a church with the ceiling is actually painted black. Uh, it's it, everything draws right to the altar. It's beautiful. It was 1960s function over form. Uh, it won awards when it was built, but it's stuck in the 60s, and it's not a pretty church. My second assignment was the cathedral, uh, and if you are familiar with the cathedral in the Archdiocese of Baltimore, it 
It has uh, the aisles 150 some feet long. It's almost as long as St. Patrick's in New York. I always remind couples, remember, the church seats 14, 1500, and you're probably going to have 150, 200 guests. Beautiful long aisle that's going to be empty. But, so that used to be a wedding factory, a, a huge wedding factory. Um, so lots of reasons why people are coming to the church to get married. We're coming head on to those. A lot of cultural questions. So some themes. This is actually the sanctuary in the cathedral up there uh, with one of those many weddings. Uh, some themes. I think vocation is clearly part of it. Discipleship. This couple is being reconfigured to living their baptismal vocation in a new way. Reconfigured to live as couple, as disciples of Christ. Certainly language and themes of covenant, sacramentality, uh, that's, you can't do that quite so overtly when we're talking about a marriage between a Catholic and a non-Christian because it's not sacramental. But when we can talk about sacramentality, we point to the couple as sacrament. I think it is pretty clear and pretty important. I, and, I, and I put God's love and human love, I have it far down the list because I think talking about vocation, about living a call and living as disciples become key language. God's love, human love, communion. We come face to face with some big cultural questions. We come face to face with some societal questions about what people understand about marriage. Um, we've got sensitivities about extended families where there may or may not be strong traditions of healthy, strong marriages. We come face to face with sensitivities where, as I'm working with couples, sometimes we get the, okay, my parents are divorced and I'm gonna have problems with seating because they can't be in the same room together mm -hmm. and they're both invited to the wedding and how do we do seating of parents when they can't be anywhere near each other? Yeah. And then they want to the reading about what God is joined together and don't. And it, and it never right. fails. Now sometimes it's the daughter or the son trying to get back at their parents. Sometimes yeah. well, so Preach about divorce in the wedding home. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you got all these. Look at my father when you do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Send them a message. We're going to show them. Um, today, I mean, the whole question of same sex marriage and where that is politically and what we talk about about marriage as one man, one woman, and who knows who's in the assembly, what they think or what their attitudes might be, yeah. or what marriage they attend or marriage they attended the week before. You know, where. Sometimes we're dealing with couples who we never even actually get them to the church for marriage because they find out that they can't have the priest or deacon officiate on the beach mm -hmm. or on the mountaintop or in the gazebo at the reception hall. And all these expectations. Comments about themes, anything that, that, that jumps out that isn't on this list? The, the one that, you know, my concern is that, that I think it's much more difficult at a wedding than it is a funeral. At a funeral, I think the priest or the presider has a lot to say and a lot that's relevant that people want to hear. Here, you're part of the furniture. You're, 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 you're you know, you, you go with the flowers and, and the uh, exact string quartet. <laughs> so so it, 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 it's not, people are not so eager about what you have to say. Yeah. Uh, so I think the critical thing is to use, to start with something with the community where people can re resonate. And I think the place you do that is human love. Mm -hmm. And if you explore that deep enough, you get to discipleship, vocation, uh, sacrifice, and where, where do we find that preeminently? Christ, God's love for us. Yeah. And God's presence in this relationship to make that possible for them. Sure. But people can relate to that because m most of them are married or have been. And understand human love, but it's really hard to uh, to to bring them to a consciousness that you actually have something that's relevant to to say. Yeah. Well, in the interest of time, then let me move yeah. on. And I was going to say a word about preaching at baptism. This is the only slide I have on baptism. This is from the rite of baptism for children. The liturgy of the word not just the homily, but the whole of the Liturgy of the Word is directed towards stirring up the faith of the parents, godparents, and the congregation and praying in common for the fruits of baptism before the sacrament itself. Uh, this might be overstating the obvious, but at preaching at infant baptism or baptism of children pre-catechetical age, 
we're obviously not talking to the one who is to be baptized, mm -hmm. unless it becomes a, a kitschy kind of mm -hmm. preaching gimmick to say, I'm going to talk to the baby, to the candidate for baptism, and then everybody else overhears. Over years. That, can, that can still be effective. Could be effective, yes. But ideally, I mean, in the end, we're not preaching to the yes. baptismal candidate. We're preaching to, and here's what the right actually says, stirring up the faith of the parents, godparents, and the congregation, because we're actually preparing them. Here's the liturgical movement, liturgy of the word, in the rite of baptism, we're preparing them to renew their baptismal promises and to be stirred up in the faith as they present this child for baptism. So here again, this piece of the liturgical moment and that progression in the liturgical act. We say some, a, a few words about the challenges that we face or obstacles that we might face in preaching in these particular contexts. Some of them we might extend to preaching on Sundays, but, but they're particularly manifest in, in this regard. How do we speak to people when they are preoccupied or distracted? Now, at weddings, lots of distraction. Uh, some would observe that you can't really preach to the couple. I mean, you can. I mean, that, 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 in terms of a preaching tool, you address everything to the couple. But they're unconscious. How much are they paying attention? They're nervous. They're distracted. Yeah. It's their big day. I, I look back at my ordination day. I'm glad that I, video, that I had a videotape of the ordinations 18 years ago. I don't know how much, I mean, as attentive as I am to the liturgy, I don't know how much I heard of, of the Cardinal's homily because I was anxious. I couldn't eat that morning. I had butterflies. And mm -hmm. so, you know, nerves. Here's this moment. It's, it's, the, it's the life moment. It's the vocation moment. How much are we really hearing that day? Sure. You know, even, even when we're prepared. In funerals, we would say people are open, but in some ways people are, are not. I look down sometimes from the pulpit, and, and the family, the, 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 the grief, the mourners look catatonic. Mm -hmm. you know, or the, you know, the, 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 the widow or widower is just kind of fixated on the coffin. They may be listening, they may not be. Who knows what's going through their minds? I, I would presume an openness, but you never know. So how to, how to speak to people in that moment of distraction? At weddings in particular, I would suggest that people, even the most faithful people, forget how to behave. I was privileged to officiate at the marriages of both of my sisters. And I was shocked. I mean, my parents are pretty active in their parish. Their circle of friends is largely members of the parish or the very neighborhood kind of parish. And at one of my sister's weddings in particular, most of the assembly, at least on, my, on our side, um, was active parishioners because that's my parents' circle of friends, our family, all active Catholics. We had three or four priests come celebrating. We had the contemporary choir there leading music. People from the group side of the family who were not really church, but Catholic. So I've never been to a wedding quite like that before. I said, like, well, you know, priest family, and this is part of what you get. I was shocked. I, the, the liturgy started. I said, the Lord be with you. And I'm looking out, and even my parents weren't paying attention. <laughs> my mother's got the camera up in her face. You all know how to behave in church. <laughs> this is where I think it's helpful not just to know about preaching, but to understand the nature of the rite. Here I am on my soapbox for a moment at weddings. I will go to the mat for doing the, the wedding liturgically well. And the thing that I will fight for the most is the entrance procession. Because it sets the stage. It sends a message that this is liturgy. And so I will always insist that both the bride and the groom at some point have to walk down the center aisle during the entrance procession. I don't do the groom coming out the side door with the groomsmen and then have the bride come down with all her attendants. It's a liturgical procession and it begins with, if we have servers, it begins with the servers, hopefully one of them carrying the cross. Lector carrying the book of the gospels. Priests celebrate the mass or efficient. Um, and then the bridal party, usually groomsmen leading the groom, hopefully with one or both of his parents, and then the bridesmaids leading the bride with one or both of her parents. And all spread out. If they're into not seeing each other, I can live with that and make sure that happens. I get the superstition, trip custom, and all that stuff, even though I don't agree with it. Um, but I'm, I, I'm willing to live with those things in order to make the, per, the, the entrance procession look like a liturgical procession mm -hmm. as an entrance into liturgy. So when people turn around and see the first thing that they see, looks like Sunday Mass, servers with the cross and candles. I had one wedding where the bride had been an altar server and she loved incense. She goes, would it be wrong to have incense at the wedding? 
Oh. I, I leapt out of my seat. I was like, oh my gosh, of course, it would be wonderful. And so the entrance procession began with the thoroughfare. Wow. And when, it came, when we were incensing the gifts, I incensed the couple as this new sacrament. Wow. And it was a beautiful moment. But incense leading the procession sent a message that this was liturgy. You could not escape that this was a liturgical moment. And I think that does set a stage for we're entering into worship. After the entrance procession singing an opening hymn, that, that then people can put their cameras down, literally put their cameras down and pick up the worship aid or pick up a hymnal, and then they feel like they're at liturgy. Maybe that opens people and, and, and strips away some of the distraction. Mm. I find that it works sometimes. As I said before, challenge, the rites themselves ought to speak clearly. There's a lot speaking, and maybe it's we're blending into the woodwork. How do, how do we speak when there's so many other things, not distracting, but so many other things vying for attention? And at a wedding, there's a lot vying for attention. Bride's dress, bridesmaids, flowers. Oh, look at the cute little ring bearer. Look at the cute little flower girl. Some things that maybe what we would say liturgically don't rightfully deserve all that much attention within the liturgy, but some things that do. The, the exchange of consent at the funeral, the casket with the book of the Gospels or the crucifix on it, the Paschal candle. Clearly, that's uh, a, a moment of attention. What are people's expectations? There are lots of expectations. At a funeral, people expect to hear something about the deceased. If you do the eulogy at the vigil or at the, before the liturgy begins, you've, in some ways, fulfilled that expectation, freeing the preacher to preach in a way that they're not expecting you. And if you don't know the deceased, maybe those are unrealistic expectations, but people expect that in some way. Maybe it's not fair, but how do you preach when there are people expecting something? At a wedding, maybe people are just expecting you to be lighthearted and funny, that that's the mood. Mm -hmm. And the more substantial homily about discipleship and vocation, if it's not meeting people's expectations, maybe they're not going to hear it because you're on a different plane. Mm -hmm. So how do you how are you aware of expectations and respond to those without necessarily giving into them, but, but can kind of preach around them? Some ways. We've already talked about some of the paying attention to the mood of the assembly. Uh, family tensions at a wedding. You know, do you have extended family issues where there's family squabbles or the, the, the parents of the bride or the groom or both who can't be in the same room with each other? How do you preach about marriage and covenant and love when you've got family tensions there? Or maybe the bride's parents don't like the groom. Or the first and second wives of the, man, of the deceased. <laughs> yeah, at the funeral. How, how do you judge grief, particular manifestations of grief? Are there family tensions that are there because you've got the, the widow and the former widow? Mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things. The circumstances of the death that, that might be you know, unexpected or expected, long-term illness or not young person, old person, some of them are obvious. I mean, you're doing a teen suicide, you, you, you can come in with some expectations that are going to be pretty obvious, and you know what the mood's going to be. Sometimes it's hard to judge. I had a funeral once for a 98-year-old woman and was shocked at the raw grief. You know, I thought, 98 years old, good full life, thanks be to God. This family had grown so accustomed that she was the matriarch of the family, and they, they were at a loss, huge loss, and I, it caught me off guard. In, in, in that. Lastly, uh, and I'm not going to go through all these, when, I'm, when I was doing preaching formation, I tried to come up with concrete scenarios, and this again isn't rocket science, but I basically took, I changed the names in all the cases, but took weddings that I'd actually done and made them scenarios and allowed the preaching students to choose readings. And I said, you know, this is a moment of Jesus walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, listening to them, asking them questions before preaching and witnessing to them. You know, when we're preparing for weddings, we're preparing for funerals, it's the let's walk with the couple, let's walk with the family of the deceased, even if it's one brief conversation, to help assess where they are and then enter into some conversation about the Word of God so as to preach. So, I would create the scenarios for them and not just say, okay, here's a wedding homily, here's the three readings, but here's the couple. Pretend to sit down with them. Here's their circumstances. Walk with them to choose readings with them 
and then prepare to preach. Yeah, I've done the same thing. That's how I, I deal with it. Yeah. I do that with very effective. I do that with the uh, with funeral. The and I've done the same thing with the funeral. So here's the funeral ones. Again, yeah. these are funerals that I had yeah, that's or participated right. in. That's right. And don't say here's funeral, here's the readings, but here is the scenario. How would you sensitively choose readings, knowing the circumstances, right. or kind of filling in the gaps of the circumstances? Choose readings, work with the family, and then preach. Exactly. Now, and I did this past spring with my seminary students is I took the profiles of the the children that were killed in that um, in school in Connecticut, yeah. and I assigned each of them <clears throat> to a seminary and uh, had them prepare. Wow. Yeah, and let me tell you, it was it was most, and they all came back and said the most powerful thing they ever had to do. I mean. They all got emotionally involved in the experience of preparing wow. the funerals and the homilies to preach at the, the, the funerals of these children who were slain. Wow. And some of them uh, broke down as they were preaching in the, in the lab. So it was really, and they said it was the most profound experience they had in preaching in the seminar. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. And it's very real. Yeah. yeah. And I find that the most important thing to yeah. do. Uh, and the deacons, particularly, I mean, and in the case of the deacons, who are mainly vigil services, they get to choose the readings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, you know, choose your gospel, and but here's the circumstances, and boy, are they different. Well, we are at the time for a break to move into the final keynote uh, presentation.